the sign to start. Um, so my talk today is about <coughs> the work that I've been doing over the last few years. I was kind of doing next to my PhD. I've now integrated it into my PhD. Uh, and now I'm exploring it a bit further here this year at, at Princeton. First, I'd like to thank uh, Jean and Laura for, uh, thank you, for, uh, for all the food and for hosting all this. And thanks also to CITP for hosting me this year. Um, so this is, you can access, if you have a laptop, you can access uh, the work uh, on this wiki site. Um, just a few quick disclaimers. So I've, I've presented va variations of this presentation at Princeton before. I think most of you haven't been at those, uh, but you may recognize some slides. Um, there are some stories that I tell about uh, different professions. They're a bit, they're abstracted on purpose and generalized. They may be a bit insulting to, to certain groups because I know most people here are quite thoughtful about what they do. But the people that I've engaged with uh, outside of you know, multidisciplinary institutes like this have been less considerate of how other disciplines think uh, about technology and about the deployment and design of technology. Um, so um, I'll talk mostly about th how I've positioned these guidelines and how I got to them and why we've set them up. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about how they work. Um, it's a bit boring to go through step by step exactly how it works. Uh, but I think if I w w once give you the examples of why uh, this work or why I find this work relevant to work on, you may understand what, what these uh, guidelines are actually trying to do. Um, and maybe to start off with, the, the main message that I want to give is, as what I hear often from technologists, is you know, lawyers and politicians should really understand technology before they start regulating it and before they start making decisions about it. I'm a lawyer and I fully agree with that. I've been trying to do that for many years now. Um, but equally, I'd like to suggest that technologists have a duty to understand the social world in which they're deploying technologies. Uh, you know, understand power shifts, understand the politics, understand the impacts on individuals and groups. Um, and actually take that responsibility and, and take it seriously. And uh, the most important thing there is to realize what you as a pr professional in your particular uh, field, to realize what you don't know and what you need to get uh, consultants from or uh, advice from, from other people. And that's kind of what these guidelines are about. It's really underpinning a conversation between the lawyers and the ethics boards and the politicians and anyone who's sort of a gatekeeper from the more political and softer side of the world with the engineers who are building the, the, you know, the logical platforms and containers within which we're actually living our lives at the moment. Um, so yeah, th 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 what we're trying to do, um, if, if you'd look at the website, there's a, a whole bunch of sections with explanations and questions. And what we're trying to do is give guidelines, especially for engineers, on which questions to ask yourself uh, when you're working on a new project, when you're designing it. Uh, we're trying to promote integrity, uh, critical thinking about values, you know, values that are impacted by technologies. And I'll go into the process that we've done uh, in a little bit, but what we found is um, this multidisciplinary reflexivity. It's a very academic term, but it's, it's a process that enables people from different disciplines to reflect on technology from different angles, ask the right questions and make decisions about how to construct that technology. You know, which sensors are you using? How, are you, how much data are you collecting? How are you uh, disseminating it? Often you hear from people uh, developing technical projects is that they informed consent would be a hurdle. Uh, informed consent is quite a, an important part of research ethics, but there are ways in which you can work around it, but you have to limit risks to the greatest extent possible and justify why you did that. Uh, and then maybe an ethics board or a lawyer or whoever has the power can decide that informed consent is indeed not necessary for your project, which could you know, wide, widen the scope of, of your data collection. Um, yeah, so the, the, the reason why this is important now is because to lawyers have often been able to regulate technologies in society, but now with increasingly uh, complex and powerful technologies. Uh, we've got new powerful actors entering the, the, the scene. The computer scientists, for example, who can look at a law and circumvent around it technologically while still complying to whatever the law says, but you know, doing things that the legislators didn't foresee. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, I'm trying to 
allow uh, people from all sides of the conversation to make the right persuasive arguments that are understood by the other disciplines which, with which you're working. So that's just to um, uh, build the scope. We, I, I started this work to actually fund my PhD a few years ago. Uh, I worked with Google Research uh, on a, a short guideline document for, for mobile data. Uh, that was taken up quite nicely. Uh, so then I got more funding to expand this work to not just privacy and mobile data, but uh, ethics in network systems broadly. Um, just a quick introduction, I'm a, I, I'm a Dutch lawyer. Um, these are my universities and I was part of the, uh, um, the, bu the bar in Amsterdam. Well, we saw there, just a, a quick story, some of you may, if you may have heard it before. But one of the reasons that I realized I needed to leave being a lawyer was a particular case uh, that was, you know, there were two people arguing about who had left a bad review on whose website. Uh, so, you know, it was a very petty sort of online uh, defamation case. Um, we went to court. We were talking about email addresses, uh, uh, you know, philip at hotmail and uh, brett at uh, gmail.com had, had been saying stuff to about each other. And at some point, the, the judge said, you know, um, okay, we're talking about Philip, we're talking about Brett, but who is Ed? And, you know, we, we said, look, we're, we're not talking about Ed, we're talking about, you know, Philip at Hotmail. And he says, you know, Philip, Ed, Hotmail, who's Ed? So we had to time out and say, okay, sorry, judge. <laughs> we'll explain to you first how email addresses work, and then we can talk about all the other things that we're trying to discuss here. So, you know, and... That was something that we ran into quite frequently, that the, the judges or the lawyers in the opposition really didn't get the technology that was being discussed. So I went to, into politics for a few years in, in Brussels, worked, you know, we implemented net neutrality in the Netherlands, tried to do the same in Europe. We worked on this huge international treaty, you know, you have the SOPA and PIPA debates here, and then you have the international one, which was called ACTA, all came at the same time. A uh, great experience to learn how uh, politicians think. Um, but, you know, just a few quotes. Th th these are American politicians. Uh, the lady who oversees surveillance technologies in the U.S. said once in a hearing, I'm not a high-tech techie, but I've been told that that is not possible. It's kind of, you know, it's she's very good, apparently, I hear, but it's kind of tricky if, you know, technologists hear this from a senior politician. Uh, and just the reason why that is, is technology uh, politicians have a lot of things to work on. They have lots of assistants working for them, giving them advice on what to say in certain moments. They're only 24 hours in a day, so it's quite difficult. So you often hear things like this if they're being questioned, you know, like, I'm not familiar precisely with what I said, but I stand by what I said, whatever it was, because they have the briefing in front of them, and then they have these difficult acronyms on you know, network technologies, and they're being questioned, so they just have to say, like, seriously, I don't know. Um, but a, an example that, that I saw in Brussels, very much uh, like this one, we had a senior politician, uh, I won't say who it is, because it was a closed meeting, uh, but he wanted to um, push this anti-copyright -cop enforcement treaty through the European Parliament. Uh, European Parliament had the power to stop the whole worldwide uh, treaty negotiation, uh, and it was nonsense. It was all about, you know, supposedly about c stopping counterfeited products, you know, which could be dangerous and are bad for trade. But if you read the thing, it was all about uh, surveilling the internet and having criminal penalties to, uh, for people who download MP3s. Um, so at some point, he. You know, we had this ho huge discussion. He was banging his hand on the table that the Internet's the Wild West and it needs to be tamed and only he can do it with this treaty. At some point, the meeting was over, but his microphone was still on and he was speaking to his friend sitting next to him. And he said, uh, you know, the beauty of this, uh, this whole policy process is that I've learned how to use the Internet because uh, we're getting so many emails from constituents, hundreds per hour, that my assistants can't cope with it. So they showed me that, you know, you, you like open a message, you press reply, then you can type a thing, you press send, and they get it instantly. <laughs> All of us uh, policy advisors who are a bit younger, and some younger politicians were sitting there, and we switched on our microphones again and said, like, so you've just admitted mistakenly that you've never used the internet, and you're regulating it on an international scale as the representative of the EU. And that was a bit embarrassing, and that's when it all started crumbling because we could make the argument, you know, these people have no idea what they're talking about. 
so that's that's you know me making fun of where I come from, my professions and my my disciplines. Um, but then, w w so what I saw was, it's so interesting when computer scientists and lawyers and philosophers start talking together. Uh, so first, I went to the uh, Oxford Internet Institute, uh, where I'm currently still finishing my PhD. It's a multidisciplinary institute. Uh, I joined the EU's Network of Excellence in Internet Science, beautiful name. Got funded by the Open Technology Fund uh, from DC, and now I'm here uh, for a year at CITP. Um, they're all, all the purpose of all these organizations is to foster multidisciplinary work, um, which I find fascinating. But I want to tell a story about you. This is a mirror, it's an image of a mirror, but this is a, mi a mirror for the technologists because uh, how, however silly the lawyers and the politicians can be, engineers can be just as silly. And I just want to give a few examples. I'll, t I'll talk about the examples in a second. I just want to go to why I've chosen these examples. But what, so what you often see, what I've often seen, put it that way, is uh, there, there are different mindsets in approaching uh, thinking about technology. Uh, the engineering have more the mindset of, you know, the end justifies the means. If my system is good, if it's efficient, if I can scale it all over the world, uh, then it's good in an engineering sense. Again, this, I'm generalizing heavily here, but you can see this often, in, especially in uh, at, you know, tech firms or governments. Um, whereas, you know, lawyers and politicians and philosophers tend to have a different view of judging whether something is good. It's not necessarily only the end that matters, but it's the steps that you take to get there. Uh, so, you know, wh what is the actual consequence of this thing that you're implementing in a society? What data is it collecting? What does it show about people? Um, and, it, you know, once you've, once all the steps to, w once all the steps of the means are good, the end, and the end is also good, then it's a good system. So it's not just the end result. Um, here, it's, it was drawn up for me a while ago in San Diego, uh, but I think it shows quite nicely the thinking. You know, this is the consequentialist way of thinking. It's useful internet research, so we should do it. Uh, and then there are these user privacy laws that are kind of vague, and you, know, you need a law degree to understand what they're, t what they're about. And we're being told that most of the time we're actually breaking the law while trying to do something useful. So how do we do this? Like how, how do we reason about this? We, we don't want to be unlawful, but we do want to do useful stuff, and not just this, like all of this. Um, which is, so I, I kind of call this the, the, the ethics gap, and I'll, I'll get more into that in a second. But here you have a big conflict between, uh, between the disciplines, because the lawyers have often have power to stop certain systems from being deployed in society. Um, whereas technologists can try and circumvent the law uh, by any means. So who rules that ethics gap? You know, is it the engineers, is it the lawyers, philosophers? Everyone thinks they have some kind of superpower. And me and my law degree, I was, I was often told that you know, we have a big responsibility because we have so much power to decide how society is going to be uh, progressed and developed and what can be done and what can't be done. So lawyers often come to problems with that idea of you know, we want we want to make the right decisions here, but engineers have a similar thing. You know, they want to create better, more efficient systems. So there's this conflict. <coughs> um, I, I drew this up quite crudely. The, the, there's no data behind this, but if this would be time, you know, as technologies are exponentially uh, getting more complex and fast, uh, and all those things, law is trying to keep up, but the legislative process is slow usually on purpose because you need a lot of time to, to actually you know, come to conclusions with big groups in society. Um, but also you know, lawyers and legislators may not exactly understand current developments, say in AI, for example. Um, so you have this governance gap. Like, uh, law used to quite closely map onto technology, say in the 70s and 80s, talking about current laws. But right now there's just this, this huge gap in the middle. Um, <coughs> Gary Marchand wrote a book about this recently, very interesting, and what he says is, uh, you know, uh, technologies are rapidly transforming economic, social, and personal domains, uh, and government is, is simply not keeping pace, and that's creating a problem. So what I think, and what I've seen in my work, is that ethics reasoning could close this gap if you want to um, you know, have your, your systems be accepted by society, or if you, as a lawyer, want to work with technologies, but your laws, you know, your toolkit doesn't cover the, the, the technologies, you can use ethics to come to um, a point of understanding. 
So just a quick 101. Ethics isn't like uh, maths. It's you know it doesn't necessarily provide a right answer. Law does have a binary distinction, although you know laws are often quite vague. But at the end of the process, you'll have this is unlawful or this is lawful. Um, engineering also has these these yardsticks. You know something is either efficient or it's less efficient. You know it's it's fast or it's not fast. Um, whereas ethics is more about argumentation and how do you reason to get to justify your position, your actions. Uh, a common definition is, you know, prescribe what humans ought to do. I would say, you know, it, it ethics provides a moral foundation for actions after having engaged critically with the alternatives. So, you know, you, you're going to deploy something, but have you thought of different <laughs> ways of employing it and why is your uh, system the best and it look, when looked at from several points of view? I borrowed this uh, slide from Keith Winstein. I, I gave a similar talk in, in Stanford last month. And I thought this was really good. You know, some, p some problems are resolvable by data, like geometry, um, while others are moral issues, like the justice system. You, sometimes you can't solve moral issues with data. Actually, usually you can't. There are efforts to try and do so, you know, weighing certain arguments, but it's tricky. Um, so in, in ethics, oftentimes, uh, we use thought experiments. The most famous one is, I think, the trolley, uh, um, the, the trolley experiment. I, I'm not going to go into it, but what it, if you these are used to um, tease out why people make certain choices. Uh, and you know, the, the the idea here is, there's a trolley coming down. Uh, it's going to kill five people if you switch the thing. Is it's only going to kill one person? Uh, and you know, ethicists will argue. Uh, have different reasons for why you should not do anything, let it go, or you should do something and kill less people. But these um, experiments make a lot of sense in you know, when there is a defined space, a defined time, when you've got rational actors who can justify their reasoning, um, and when the, when the impact of, of actions is actually quite clear. So in network systems, it's a little bit different. There's an undefined space. It's basically the global internet uh, within which you're operating. The uh, parameters are constantly evolving. The, the networks are growing. The, the, the technologies are becoming more complex, faster. Uh, there are so many actors with diverging motives, most of which we don't understand. Um, you know, some companies may be profit maximizing, whereas others you know, would say that they think privacy is important, but click away every terms and conditions just to use the app. Uh, people aren't speaking the same language, uh, literally or disciplinary. Um, some things aren't quite clear on the internet. You know, if, if you say we're only going to store your data for six months, is that actually respected? Oftentimes you see that it's not. It's, you know, it's just, it's still stored, but not used in the system but that data will probably be stored forever, uh, which could then later at some point be reused. Um, so yeah, the, 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 we're just talking about different environments completely. Uh, so what, what I found is, I'll get back to this later, but I, I, this purely engineering mindset isn't quite sufficient to really think, think through the impact uh, of technologies. There's, there's too many unexpected consequences that engineers in their offices don't have the tools to think through. And that's not, um, I'm not trying to be insulting there, it's just lawyers also don't have that. Um, so what we did is we organized for about two years, two and a half years, lots of workshops all around the world. Here's a list of uh, where we've been. I think there were even more. What we always tried to do is get a 50-50 split of engineers and uh, uh, philosophers and lawyers in the room. I think a few of you have been there. Uh, sometimes it wasn't quite 50-50, but we did try and strive for that. And what we would usually ask is for engineers to present a project that they'd been working on uh, and talk about the dilemmas that they'd run into. Uh, and maybe also discuss the, the how they reasoned to come to a better solution. So, you know, wh were they at some point stopped by an IRB or did they hear from stakeholders or, you know, data subjects that actually what they were doing was quite harmful? How did they rethink the problem and what was their reasoning behind it. And what you often saw was that the um, uh, the lawyers would be quite um, shocked and the philosophers about how the engineers reasoned about these things. Um, I'll give a few examples of this in, in a second. But 
generally what computer scientists tend to do, again, very generalized and likely not as applicable in this room, but I'm, I'm borrowing this slide from Bettina Berendt, but I thought it was particularly good. You know, computer scientists believe they can define anything. So you need a, a definition as a functional requirement usually. Then you believe that is the truth. Then you believe that you could solve it because that's your task, that's your job. Uh, and this is you know, sort of uh, Morozov's solutionism. So but that, was, that goes back to that previous slide of you know, if you're confronted with a problem, even if it's a social justice problem or something, you develop an algorithm that will help a judge think through certain things and you've collected so much data and you, know, you come out with a value on a particular case and you say, you know, we've solved the problem of whichever it is that you're trying to solve. Now, um, in these workshops, th this would often be said, you know, the engineer would say, what should we solve all the world's problems? You know, all we have to do, is, all we need is more data, more sensors. Uh, people actually need to use these outputs. And then the philosophers would say, you know, you have to understand that this is a social technical system, not just technical. Technical data is not enough to solve these problems. Uh, this system actually has an impact on people's lives, changes their environments, uh, also in the physical space. Um, so be careful trying to be the technical solutionist. Um, I said, or did, I usually say this when I give a quick talk at, at uh, workshops or conferences, but it's important to realize that tools are not neutral. Uh, what matters is the social and economic systems in which they're embedded, that, that they give purpose to technologies. Um, I said this, a you know, t technology is not value free, I said this recently, I flew to Sydney to a blockchain conference, uh, flew 23 hours, I had to speak at 9.30 in the morning, I arrived at 6.30 or something. So I was really tired and jet lagged, started talking about technologies not being neutral. And this um, engineer, after a few minutes, said, I fundamentally disagree with everything that you've said. Uh, and one of these typical engineers, you know, like Metallica shirt and long hair and everything. and. Um, we had a bit of a, you know, I'm generalizing again, but it was, he was this stereotype. And we had a bit of a discussion back and forth, and he just, he just would keep repeating that, you know, he is not interested in politics. He thinks all politicians are stupid. Um, and that, you know, he, he doesn't read anything about that. All he cares about is the pureness of his blockchain technologies. Uh, and we tr I tried to convince him, some other people in the audience also tried to convince him to say, you know, you got to watch out here. Like you're, you're actually changing things in society. It's like no, 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 no. This is all mathematics, blah. blah. So I sat down and if, uh, over a few days and just kind of like noted down what the assumptions are that um, these engineers often have. You know about decentralization and disintermediation, radical transparency, all being virtues of blockchain systems. And I put in brackets behind you know what, what my problems with those uh, were. I'm not going to go through all of them. You can have a, a quick look, but. What it, what it comes down to is uh, they have certain ideas about how blockchain technologies work and what the general first effect is. Uh, but actually, if you think it through, there, is a, there are a lot more social effects. Uh, here's another, another list. Um, so, you know, after a while, after a few days, I went back to him and I said, you know, you may be inherently apolitical, but you are creating power shifts in society, you know. Uh, very basic example, I think he was working on, on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, you're taking power away from central banks and that's your aim. Like you want, And then he would say things like, I don't trust governments, so I want to destroy all the institutions. So, you know, that's going quite far, but for everyone else in the room, it was quite true. Like their, the motivation to work on blockchain was to create power shifts in society, which could be fine and justified, but they didn't justify them. They just hated banks and hated politicians. So <laughs> that's why they, they worked on that. Um, so, you know, and, but when I, s when I told him you have to actually understand and justify the shifts that you're creating, that's when he really started understanding that indeed he was meddling in politics through his technologies. Um, we've spoken about this uh, research extensively. I'll just quickly go through it. This is done by a few people here and at Georgia Tech. Um, and I've also added the uni uh, probe to it. Um, Philip, do you work on the uni probe? Oh. Okay, well, so we've had both um, both uh, technical research present at some of these workshops, and I just wanted to show you quickly how differently people thought. So this, in very short, these are censorship measurement systems that are done through people's devices in countries where researchers don't have access to the network. 
So say in China, um, there's a lot of uh, censorship on the internet. So to measure it, you have to be on, on the network there. So the best way is to be on someone's device and do requests from there uh, and then collect that data back. So, you know, what technologies, te technologists would say, uh, very uh, abstracted, is, you know, we're using existing URL lists, so we're not choosing where we're sending people. Um, we are sending people to sites that we think or know are censored. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, the New York Times website having a Facebook button and Facebook collecting that information. Like, they're, they're you're initiating information flows that, um, uh, that any, everyone does in the internet. There's trackers everywhere. Uh, it's not human surgery research, it's only people's mobile phones and their devices. I, you know, we're not experimenting with their, their, their bodies or their minds. Um, no one's been harmed, so, you know, everything's fine. Uh, one person, fortunately not from here, but <laughs> said, uh, you know, we're not going to know what governments actually think of us doing these censorship tests until someone ends up in jail. Um, because then they've had the course and the, the, the court case and they've explained their reasoning, which really shocked uh, a, lo a lot of the philosophers. And uh, as I said earlier, in, in informed consent on these kinds of things, which severely limit the scope of data collection, because most people in these countries would disagree to, u to let American researchers <laughs> use their phones to check government censorship, uh, which is also kind of, <laughs> I mean, yeah. But, you know, it, it, was, it was an argument that was made. So the ethicists would come back and say, you know, if, if you th so we looked up the, the URL lists and there were things like Falun Gong on there, you know, like banned sex, sects in China, that if you're part of it, you can get arrested and maybe even sent to some concentration camp. Uh, they would send people to pornography sites that were uh, banned in these countries. And the, the maybe pornography itself may not be banned in China, I'm not sure, but in many countries, uh, gay porn, for example, uh, has a very severe penalty on it. So, uh, you know, if you're sending people to that without them knowing, you're sending them to extremely harmful websites. It's you could compare it f from a you know, legal penalty point of view of the New York Times sending you to child pornography websites, where there's a penalty for I don't know how many years in prison on. But it's it's you know, th from a legal point of view, it's it's actually a similar thing, not technical. Um, and you know. How d we, we were wondering, like, how, how did they know no one had been harmed? Uh, had they checked in China and wherever else they, uh, they launched these systems? Because likely you wouldn't hear about it as an American researcher. Uh, and also, you know, what, what constitutes harm? You know, is, is harm only when the police comes by your house and pulls you out of your bed at 3 a.m.? Or is it putting you on all sorts of lists that you may be a dissident in a country? And talking about China again, they have this social rating system uh, which is being implemented at the moment. What would that mean for your social rating if you know, the, my Chinese counterpart would be sent to every single illegal website in China thousands of times for the days on end? You know, it could really reduce uh, my standing in the society. I'm not judging the, the, the systems they have there. But um, yeah, so what, what really constitutes harm? You, like th they hadn't thought about it and likely you don't know. Um, again, the ethicist said, you know, okay, it may indeed not be human subject research, but it could definitely be human harming research. So, uh, and that's, we should probably start considering putting that in as a subcategory of human subject research. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave the others. Uh, so, what the outcome was of this uh, is that some of these papers got rejected at, at, um, uh, at conferences. Uh, at, at one conference, they did get accepted, but only once they had completely uh, scaled down the amount of websites that they were allowing, uh, letting people visit. So previously, it was thousands of known banned websites. Now it was five websites like Google and Yahoo News and things like that. Um, so that's there you already see uh, you know, assessing the, the impact of the technology and scaling it down to something where not that many values are impacted. Um, and UNI has a really interesting uh, informed consent procedure now, which I'm proud to say is based on my uh, on that framework that I showed at the beginning. But they um, uh, they really make sure that the people who are going to be uh, sending out requests to banned websites or blocked websites know exactly what's going on and have given feedback about what they think the harms are. Um, this has also started this multidisciplinary debate. These examples. 
uh, especially with the computer scientists coming into this a bit more. Uh, but the main question is, you know, if if this kind of research does get through uh, ethics boards at universities, but doesn't get through at conferences, maybe there's something actually broken in the way that uh, research ethics is done in computer science. Um, and again, like I've heard from many computer scientists, that it's easier to just <coughs> give a whole load of information, uh, you know, databases and algorithms to reviewers at ethical boards, and say that there is no human subject research and no, no harm to humans, uh, rather than sitting down with it and explaining in, in human language what it actually is that you're doing. Because once you start doing that, you get questions back and you run the risk of not uh, being able to do your research, uh, which is obviously, you know, again shows that. The, the process probably isn't quite right at the moment. Uh, another quick example is the um, Internet Census 2012. It's called the Karna Botnet. I'll go through this, one, through this one a bit quicker, but basically what this was is researchers had found this forgotten about backdoor in um, Linux systems. They built a botnet that could replicate itself uh, and would just try, you know, it was like uh, admin and password were also the words for admin and password, whatever it was, but it was really easy to get in. What they found is one in 10 Linux systems actually had still had that backdoor and didn't change the, um, uh, the login credentials. So what this botnet would go into a system, once it was there, it would check out the whole network and try and find similar systems, and one in 10 it would get into and it would do the same. Uh, after a year of running, I think there were in about half a million systems, some of these were, uh, you know, security doors or industrial control systems uh, that, you know, in wherever they were, somewhere in the world, somewhere on the network. Um, but they were in these systems. They weren't doing anything. They were just collecting data on what the network looked like. And the reasons they gave is, you know, we're creating a huge map of the Internet. Yes, it's through illegal use of uh, infiltrating devices, but it's the best data set that uh, we've ever had about the Internet. Uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're nice, we're not going to break things, uh, and you know, everything, that all the data that we gather, we're just going to uh, publish in the public domain so everyone can use it. So, you know, we're angels, we're, we're, we're the good guys. But the ethicist said, that, you know, do you, do you actually know, do you have any idea who these half a million systems, or what they do, who owns them, what it shows about people? Uh, you know, if, if you're disseminating data about half a million systems that can be compromised, uh, you know, what, what risks are you running into there for these people? Um, uh, and you're infiltrating systems, so can you justify that you're actually doing that? It's, it's in most countries, it's illegal to just ju uh, infiltrate a system. So can you give a better justification than we're creating a huge map of the internet? And what I thought was most important in these discussions was, you know, is this a precedent that we actually want to be setting? Do, do we want engineers to just, um, you know, because they're good, do something that is illegal and unethical? Um, because it will then be published, the methodologies, the data will all be available. And the next person may also not be a bad engineer, but they would take that methodology and add one more thing to it, you know, collect one more bit of data, or one more, try one more d vulnerability. Um, and you know, slowly but surely, people can keep pointing at this line of research until it does go completely wrong. Um, I'll leave this one as well. So. Um, you know, th this data set is being used for all sorts of purposes. Uh, I've seen it being footnoted in, in policy debates. Um, but the, the people who did this research, they were anonymous, uh, or they chose to, to remain anonymous, um, because I think they also realized it wasn't quite ethical. And they've redesigned their research and published it recently with their names on it, so I think it's quite clear who, who did the first one. But where they really stated that this time they thought about the means of getting to the data, um, and now they think they're it's ethically just. But you're thinking about precedent setting. I'm not sure if you've heard about the showdown <coughs> baby monitor scandal. It was like a year and a half ago or something, where you could use a very similar uh, methodology to get into millions of you know, baby camera and microphone devices. Um, this one, so this, yeah, it was, uh, about a year ago. And you could get images like this. And I visited the website, and indeed, you can just like, click through and like, click on an IP address, and then you get to the baby monitor. So uh, you know, if, if you're this guy, if you're the politician, and you hear about this, and you want to come across as like, a strong leader, especially in the wild west of the internet, you're going to be very harsh on these types of methodologies. So there is 
a, a consideration for these types of communities to, to you know, self-correct or have some principles of you know, which precedents do we want to set and which do we not. It's a very difficult discussion, but I think if you don't, as an engineering community, you'll run into politicians who may not know exactly what they're talking about, but they'll try and ban certain technologies or methodologies. Uh, really quick, just, just a data example, it's a discussion I had with um, some researchers who wanted to use Patreon data. Uh, Patreon is a website for crowdfunding where you know, people who have web comics or play music online uh, get their fans to give them some money maybe once a week or per video or something like that. It wasn't a very huge website, but their whole database was hacked, uh, it was um, published. And this researcher told me that you know, this was a gift to him because finally he could research how this website worked. And uh, it, it was more of like a uh, computational sociologist like Matt Sardanic, it wasn't Matt. Um, but so we had a bit of a discussion because he said, you know, how can these people still have an expectation of privacy when, they're, when the database is breached? And I had to really make the point that you know, these people had an expectation of privacy when they shared the data with the service. Uh, and now what's happening is you're, create, you're using this data in a different context. You're creating a new audience for it. You're republishing it again. Uh, that is the breach of privacy. It's, it's, it's maybe a simple example for most of you, but I've, I found engineers have a, a weird way of thinking that you know, once information is free, we can use it. Uh, you know, there's no more privacy attached to it because information security is being breached. Um, and then you, you, we all know these sites, if you think one step further, if you think about these petition sites, what if their databases get breached uh, and reused for all sorts of uh, all sorts of reasons? And then you know, the, the most doom scenario type thinking there would be um, something like a petition for uh, or against anti-homosexual laws in whichever form in a country like Uganda where there's a death penalty on being gay. Um, you sign up to this, say breaches, and there are a thousand Ugandans in the website it's going to be particularly easy for the government to you know, add some people to death row or at least you know, go to the houses and question them. Um, so you know, you've really got to think about what databases you are creating and what they would mean if they would be breached and published. This year at CITP, I'm applying this framework to some more examples, uh, exact blockchain governance as I talked about, some gender-based violence apps. Um, While well, we're talking about particularly sensitive data flows for particularly vulnerable groups, uh, data and algorithmic transparency with, with Arvind, IoT uh, on campuses. You know, we're trying to tease out some of the ethical questions there. The reuse of smartphone data and again, um, censorship research. The AI and legal personhood workshop that we're organizing soon isn't quite part of this framework, but it's still uh, the using this similar methodology. Um, so I, I hope that through these quick examples, I've kind of showed you that this engineering mindset is a way to think about technology and how to design it, but it's not necessarily the best way. Um, and it could often be complemented with some insights from outside, usually done through conversation. So not just, here's my final app, what do you think of it? But really, you know, when you're thinking through the governance of data flows and uh, wh how you're collecting data, how, wh what, it's, what the effect is going to be on people's physical you know, living environments, you won't get that from just a purely engineering thinking, likely. Um, in Canada, they have a ring for engineers. Uh, it's, it used to be made out of uh, metal from the Quebec Bridge, which broke uh, and killed lots of people uh, due to engineers trying to be as efficient as possible in building their bridge. Uh, and this is a reminder for engineers that graduate that they have a social function, that they really need to think through their technologies and the social impact and not just go for efficiency. Um, so I'll quickly talk about the guidelines in, in a few minutes. Um, and what I'm trying to do in this, in this document is learn from existing technology ethics methodologies. And, you know, you've got the traditional technology and research ethics, but you've also got value sensitive design. I'm sure you've heard of this in, in some way. Uh, and then there's the Dutch um, policy that we have on constructive technology assessments. It's a very sort of inclusive debate. Um, yeah, it's a very political way of understanding and, and uh, allowing technologies. But as I said earlier, uh, the, these guidelines need to be different necessarily because it's a different logical space from the physical world. Time and sp space dimensions are different. 
uh, may be even irrelevant. And because we're not talking about you know, a power plant in a particular town, but we're talking about an app that can be scaled worldwide, you have to think about uh, how different cultures approach ethics. Uh, you know, what is right for Silicon Valley Americans or Princeton Americans or Oxford academics may not be right for Germans, Japanese, Indians, or you name it. Um, so I'm not the biggest supporter of Kant, but I think what he says here is really important also for uh, engineers to realize, you know, always treat people as ends in themselves, not merely as means to an end. Thanks, Johanna, you <laughs> corrected me a while ago when I, uh, I said this one wrong. But um, yeah, you have to value a person um, or n you, you shouldn't value a person just because they allow you to achieve a different end. Um, so if you, if you want to update this for 2017 in internet research, you know, a person could include their smartphones and their IP addresses and their browsers. Don't, don't just assume that the whole, all internet users are there for your technical experiments. They're actual people and whatever you do to their devices, to their data, has an actual or may have an actual effect on them and that effect could be way more negative that you can than you can uh, conceive here in Princeton or elsewhere. Um, so here's just a quick overview of, of the thought process. It's a bit of a boring graph but what I wanted to show you is that we've divided these guidelines into four steps and each step has different subtitles with some questions. Um, you can access it here again. I'm not going to go through all these questions, but the questions are kind of written in a way to hopefully to make the answer not a yes or no answer, but to make the engineers and the lawyers think about what it actually is um, that they're trying to achieve in their systems. Uh, I won't go through all of them, but h here are some more. Um, you know, does your project potentially set a precedent for unethical methodologies that could be misused by others in the future? You could say no, but then you get a question from the lawyer, like, you know, what, how about this, how about that? And then you have a, a discussion based on that. So quickly to go through what we're trying to achieve in these, uh, with these questions is we're trying to, we're trying to develop a story about the, the project. You know, what's it going to do? What's the aim of the project in the context where you're launching it? Uh, who are the stakeholders? Who are you benefiting? What data are you collecting? What are, what are your assumptions of this uh, technology? You know, uh, thinking about the blockchain thing. You know, are you going for radical transparency in all transactions, for example? Um, think about the, the, the power balances in the context. Uh, um, you know, the risks of harm. Think about, you know, have an understanding of the laws that govern uh, the technology in that particular context. And once you've answered all these questions, you get some, um, I'd call them ethical functional requirements that, um, kind of set the base for how to think about these technologies, the technology that you're developing. Uh, so the second step would be an analysis of um, how these values and these, you know, the laws that you're impacting, how they're impacted by these technologies. Um, if you look on the website, there's, there's more information about it, but basically what it comes down to is really laying on the one hand the technical design and on the other hand the values, and you can build links, and draw links between them and really discuss, you know, is this actually, is this privacy infringement justified? Uh, if not, do we collect less data? Would it then be justified? You know, if we're only collecting IP addresses rather than names and addresses and whatever else, are we breaching privacy less? And there's, there's a lot more to it. Uh, I won't go into much more detail. But then once you've kind of stated these tensions that the technology is going to inflict in society, then you can start thinking about the alternatives, you know, as I said, the, the, the data collection, but also the scope of the project. You know, do you need to scale it to the whole world or can you also just focus it in like a little university community in Texas, for example? Uh, would that, from a research perspective, still give you similar results? Um, uh, you know, the, your methodology. And from there, you can, you can iterate this process a bit because if you've really redesigned your project, you can go back and see, you know, has the context changed within which we're launching this? Uh, have certain other parameters changed? And at some point, once you've gone through this a few times, and it sounds very tedious, but it can be done quite quickly. Uh, once you think that you've eliminated the risks to the, the largest extent and you, you can justify the benefits and why you're doing certain things, you can write that up in a short <laughs> ethics statement. You know, these are considerations we've had. Uh, this is what, what we think the technology is doing. 
we don't think we need informed consent because this and this, or we do, and this is how we formulate an informed consent. Um, we give some guidance on how to do that. Um, so this is just a quick overview of what we came to out of all these uh, workshops and kind of th the questions that engineers themselves thought would be important to ask of their students or of their peers. Um, so you know, th this has been developed with support from the ACM and Google Research, and we're now talking to the Association of Internet Researchers uh, to take this up in their current review. The IEEE uh, is interested to um, implement this for, for their projects. We've got presentations coming up at, in Washington, Arlington at the NSF and at the European Commission, who for their internet research are interested to maybe you know, point at this website and say, like, can you answer these questions for us before you get your grants? Nothing has been signed or agreed yet, but at least as these discussions are happening. Um, future work could be interesting, you know, applying this to artificial intelligence. It's a very different domain again. It's not just technology and information flows, it's also, you know, you know artificial intelligence. But you know, it'll be an interesting case to see how these kinds of questions hold up there. Um, some people have even been talking about creating ethics modules. Um, that you can, you know, if you have a machine learning system, that you download this ethics module and place it on, and that the machine learning system, while it's changing its algorithms and, and use of data you know, on a scale that humans can't, uh, can't keep pace with, that the ethics module would then steer it in the right direction. It's, you know, as Brett knows, it's, uh, many people have said that this simply isn't possible, but it's interesting to start thinking about functional requirements for such a system. Uh, rather than just dismissing it. Um, we'll see. Um, be nice to see conferences take this up. Uh, you know, say, um, if you think there are ethical issues with your paper, go to this website, answer the relevant questions, and come back to us. And we're talking currently also about creating a repository of cases where people have used these questions uh, and have answered them, uh, and then would send their one or two pager to us uh, so we can just place them in the repository so people can go back and there will actually be a, um, uh, I guess, precedence, you could call it, for ethical reasoning at particular conferences or universities. Um, so I'll leave it here. Here's just a funny little comic <laughs> that you can read. It kind of shows that like, you know, if you're going to create ethics modules in self-driving cars, you're going to get through some very, very <laughs> complex calculations. And it's simply not going to work if you use current ethics. Um, read it in your own time. Um, but I'll leave it there, and I'll take questions. Thank you.